And good morning, everybody. Welcome. You made it to Friday. It's the Food Safety Foundation and our Food Safety Chat Live. Of course, we do this every Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain Time and 10 a.m. Eastern. And of course, times all around the world, people on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube attend these sessions from all over the world. So we're really grateful to have you here. Um, what's great about these conversations is these are our conversation around food safety. This is not a presentation. This is not a PowerPoint with somebody going through slides. This is an insight into some of the things that are going on in the world of food safety. And part of this end is that interaction. And we absolutely love it when we have interaction on this forum. So one of the things we like to do is at the beginning here, everybody, let us know where you're at in the world. So I am in Loveland, Colorado in, I can't spell this morning, in the good old USA. And Paige Appleton, my guest this morning. Good morning, Paige. Good morning. And technically, what city here in Colorado are you in? Currently, I'm in Commerce City. I'm li I live in Denver, though. Okay, yep. So I'm about, oh, an hour or so north of Paige. And it has been really hot here in Colorado. It's supposed to be low 90s Fahrenheit here today, but it's been in the upper 90s. Um, so what, 32, 33 or so centigrade, uh, hot. But luckily out here in Colorado, not a lot of humidity, so that's always a good thing. Uh, Susan, good morning, uh, dirty Jersey. <laughs> that's where I'm, I'm from, New Jersey. <laughs> I, I used to go to New Jersey quite a bit when I worked with White Way Foods. We had a plant in Bridgeton, so I would fly into Philly and go down to Vineland, stay down there. And, and Oh, nice. It, yeah, South, that's a different thing. I, I'm from North Jersey, like, you know, the 732. Well, what's interesting with New Jersey, right, is people think of it as North New Jersey, right? Princeton and these type of things around New York City, really congested, crowded. Hey, Jersey. Um, but you get to the south, it's, it's open and there's farms and strawberries and tomatoes and you can go down to the beach and at the Cape. And it's the farther south you go, the sandier the soil gets, right? So you have these pine trees and stuff like that. It's really pretty. Yeah. Down there. I used to work in Princeton um, at Church and Dwight. That was my previous company. Ah, nice, nice. Uh, Tammy, Austin, Texas. Uh, good morning. Austin, well, that's a hot spot. I know tons of people moving there. Brandon? Chicago. Yeah. Good morning, Brandon. You look familiar, Brandon. I think I know you from somewhere. Nice. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Um, interesting talk. Well, I guess before we get started here, too, on this, we were, we were talking about dogs. <laughs> so we'll get on here and have a little bit of a chat before we start the live stream. And we were talking about our dogs and how goofy they are. And uh, I, I have a small Yorkshire Terrier, and uh, he's 15 and a half now. And just like people, right, once you get to old age, it's like, nope, here's how I do things. This is how I want things done. And one of the things that he has decided is he likes to be hand fed. <laughs> and so part of my job as a work, you know, a work at home uh, consultant, uh, manager of the Food Safety Foundation is taking care of Lenny. So that's always, always a challenge with Lenny. Uh, good morning, Lance. Um, Northern California, nice area to be. So uh, one of the things, and Paige, this is something I always forget, and I always want to jump in because I want to get right on the topic. <laughs> Susan agrees with my dog comment. Um, is we forget our beverage, right? So our sip, right? So everybody join us for the Friday celebration, the morning drink of your favorite beverage, ours, our coffee. Black, so you can taste all of the flavors, all the aromatic compounds coming through without the, uh, without dairy clouding, clouding our judgment. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it's always ironic. So for me working, I worked in food companies for over 20 years and we would of course have sensory panels and things like this. And you have to go through a screening to get on the sensory panel. And I always failed. I, there were certain things that I just couldn't pick up very well. And so they're like, eh, no, that's okay, Brian. I'm like, oh, so I, that was always funny. Hey, it's, it's a challenging program to be a part of, even more challenging to lead. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, good morning, Austin. And what's interesting with, with sensory, and this is just a quick little, you're off to the side here on, on sensory, is that there's really kind of two categories for sensory. And I think companies sometimes kind of forget this. There's the technical aspects of sensory, of what you're trying to pick up for attributes and trends and things of which from a baseline, the products are moving. And sensory panels are super valuable in in-house sensory panel, not consumer panels. And using that as setting your baseline. But those aren't what complaints come from, right? Complaints come from when you have changes in the product that a consumer can pick up, right? So if someone goes out and buys your product, 
and says, well, this, this is not right, right? You, you, you drink your coffee and it's the same coffee you've been buying for five years and all of a sudden it's different, right? And then, whoa, what, what's going on here, right? Completely different sensory mode. Um, it's like when you're monitoring things in a plant, right? You're looking at pH, things like this. I've never had a complaint where a consumer said, hey, I, I tried your product and the pH appears to be off. No, of course not, right? They're going to say, wow, this tastes weird. And that's pretty much what you go on. And sensory panels can really help you with those type of things. And I'm sure yeah, we, yeah, as you said he's on sensory panel. I, I, I think he can, he can attest to that as well. Yeah, we do the same thing, Brian. We have like a the true to target assessments, but we also have something called a disaster check. Uh -huh. which is the one, the one where it's like, you know, is the consumer going to know about this? And in the CBD world, unfortunately, um, it, the consumers are so variable. Um, you know, sometimes people are, you know, sen very sensitive to bitterness. Other times they're not. That's a, one of those inherent product characteristics that we're dealing with that are uh, interesting to kind of like standardize for our, our consumers. Absolutely. And, and that's why I'm so excited to have you on this morning, Paige is Paige is the QA manager with Caliper Foods, Stillwater. And she works in an industry that I think has really got a lot of people's attention here over the last few years. And that's the marijuana, CBD, THC, all these types of things space. And of course, Colorado is a hotbed for activity in this area. And what's really cool about it is that um, this is a brand new industry, right? It, it's in some ways we hear it described as the wild west and there's all these different things going on, right? And there's tons of innovation and new things coming on. So it's really an exciting time. Definitely is. <laughs> Been in it for four years. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of it, right, is, is we're kind of making up our rules along, along the way. And one of, one of the things here in Colorado that I did, I was showing this page, she, she got a good laugh out of, is so this is one of the first books here in Colorado that came out from from the legislature on the rules and the laws uh, regulations around marijuana how it's registered and of course if you're the state how it's taxed right that's what they care about and all of those type of things and she, and I, I pulled this up and she's like oh yeah that's that's like way way out of date right because things are changing fast that's for sure yes. So uh, Paige is also a member of the Food Safety Foundation. So I'm probably going to hit you up a little bit on that, too, if you can kind of explain people how that benefits you as well, too. So fair warning on that. So let, let's kind of dive in. Tell, tell us a little bit about Caliper Foods, Stillwater, the companies, what they are. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit of company history. So I was originally hired um, as a associate, a food scientist to do product development on our gummies um, for Stillwater Brands. Stillwater Brands is a manufacturer of Ripple. We used to do a line of teas and uh, instant coffee. Those are, we don't no longer do those, um, but now we do Ripple and gummies. We also do quick sticks, which are kind of like um, cannabis infused pixie sticks. Uh -huh. um, so that is one of our businesses. Um, we also do CBD as a completely separate entity. Um, so I also, I work on both sides. Uh, CBD is called, the CBD business is called Caliper Foods. We do offer, we have e-commerce and wholesale um, for our, cal our retail product, which is the same um, product platform, which is that water-soluble cannabinoid, um, which is truly our bread and butter um, mm -hmm. across THC, CBD, whatever, whatever cannabinoid we're talking about, we can make it water-soluble. That's our, our technology. Um, so for Caliper, we do those retail sales and we also have an ingredients business. So we sell to other companies um, that want to infuse a RTD beverage, a snack, um, anything. We've even talked to companies about cosmetics. Um, <laughs> since there is regulatory ambiguity, the options are endless right now. Um, so we are basically the uh, all around CPD supplier uh, for CBD um, products. Ah, OK, so like with the with the products like Ripple and things like this, so that people understand this, right? It, it, it's a powder, right? So you, you right. take the CBD or the THC, and then you make this powder, and then people can add this powder to drinks, or you can yes. throw it in whatever. And yep. it's a very unique uh, methodology. And also, I think it allows for standardization as well, too. Totally. Um, yeah, standardization and, and qual quality control and consistency um, are, so related to consumer experience and that has been you know one of our major drivers i think for sales um people are look at us as a company that's very dependable um mm -hmm. every every time they consume one of our products they get the same experience every time 
Um, and to me, that's really important, especially when you're dealing with a psychoactive. Um, now, obviously, CBD is not in that category, but um, being a science-based company that really believes in quality and consistency, um, it's honestly the product that we make and the manufacturing processes that you know our company has built make it pretty easy. Um, <laughs> I, as a quality assurance manager, I would say that um, in the grand scheme of things um, for other food products, this product platform and what we make here is not a huge challenge from a food safety perspective. Um, it is a really huge challenge from a regulatory perspective. Uh, oh, I can imagine. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and this is a confusing topic for a lot of people, right? So THC, CBD, what, what's the difference between the two? Uh, a huge difference. Um, so, and I saw Su Susan's questions. Uh, we do not need a, a prescription here in Colorado for THC products. Um, that, that really depends on where you are, what state you're in. Um, there are some states that only have medical licenses. There are other states that have recreational. So if you're recreational, st if you're a recreational state, you can go at, oh, anyone over 21 can go in and purchase. Um, so that yeah, you don't need a prescription here in Colorado. But um, Brian, to answer your question, the difference between CBD and uh, THC is huge. Um, they're completely different cannabinoids and they work with your endocannabinoid system differently. Um, CBD is non-psychoactive and has some, you know, a lot of data out there that is suggesting that it has anti-inflammatory effects. Um, it can contribute to, you know, a calming effect. Of course, um, it is not you know, it has not gone through NDI. It's not an approved uh, dietary supplement or anything like that. So we don't have um, hard, real claims that we can make. Um, but, you know, dealing with anxiety, helping with sleep um, and reducing pain are some of the things that the industry is really driving. Um, and we have to be careful again about what claims we make as a business. But those are the things that CBD helps with. THC, on the other hand, um, Again, I mean, the internet can tell you a lot more than I can probably about the difference. <laughs> but uh, with the Delta 9 ver you know, version of THC, that is the psychoactive uh, component of cannabis. So when you, <laughs> everyone thinks about like when you're getting high, that's the thing that's making you high. Um, mm -hmm. And it does differ um, when you're smoking, inhalables versus edibles are a little bit different. And within the category of edibles, there is even more difference. Um, so if you're consuming something that, you know, is, produced with just THC distillate, which is an oil, um, your body can't break down all of that. Um, it, it's not as bioavailable as if you emulsify the THC, the oil. So you're basically taking huge droplets and large chunks of fat. Um, you know, typically people think about pot brownies, um, you know, the cookies, you know, baked goods, things that are really easy to take that oil and you know, dissolve it in the butter so you can get a nice homogenous mixture when you're when you're infusing a good. Um, our product is water soluble or technically water compatible. Um, so what we do is, you know, we take it and we have a standard emulsion size. Um, so we break that oil down into smaller droplets so that your body can actually absorb more of it. So mm. our product is like the bang for the buck is much better. Um, we have a clinical, we're the only company that actually does have a human based clinical study um, for cannabis, um, mm. saying that we are 450 times more absorptive than some of our competitors. Wow. Um, it's that it was a huge, sorry, I got to plug us, you know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it's interesting here in Colorado. So I would, I would imagine, you know, a lot of people are in the same boat as me because, yeah, Colorado law from like these laws in 2014 have evolved. So originally it was like the, it was the medical side where right? you had to go to a doctor and get a prescription and then you could go to these special dispensaries and then you could get your, your medication, right? Essentially it was how it was treated. And then they kind of changed the rules and then they said, okay, it's all right, fine. It's open. You can have your medical license, which I think gives people a cheaper price. And then, but there's also then the recreational so side. Medical, it's not necessarily cheaper per uh -huh. se, Brian, but you can, you can get a lot more milligrams per unit. So uh -huh. in the recreational world, we're limited. Um, and a lot of states are doing this. You're limited at a hundred milligrams of THC. So one gram of THC per consumer unit. Um, so you can get multiple hundreds of milligrams. So like several grams of THC per unit. Um, when you buy from a dispensary, if you're in the medical realm, 
So oh. people that have extremely high tolerances, um, you know, or need, you know, need a lot of, of THC to control their pain um, or, you know, appetite, people that are going through chemotherapy, for instance, um, you know, they might need a lot, you know, higher doses to, in order to get themselves to feel better. So that, I think that's one of the major differences in terms of what the consumer might expect when they go into a dispensary for medical versus recreational. Interesting. Now, I think that's a good point because part of this is a lot of this information isn't known, right? It's not readily available. It's like there's a lot of confusion around there. And I think, and I, I've been to, I've been to uh, dispensaries here in Colorado, and they I think the stores do a good job of training their their teams to help educate when people come in because I think a lot of people are like me, right? Middle aged guys who have never tried this type of thing before. And it's like hey, you know, I'm wondering what's up with this whole THC, right? And you, and you go to these stores. And it's very interesting when you go to these stores because you have kind of what I, I refer to as the connoisseurs. Right? It's, it's almost like um, uh, people who are like very nice wines, right? Very fine wines and they collect them and the, oh, I can smell this boysenberry in the wine and things like this. I remember I was in a dispensary and there's this guy and you know, he was he was buying uh, marijuana buds, the, the flowers to make, um, you know, like cigarettes or whatever they do. And he was like, you know, like opening the jars and smelling them. He's like, hmm, I, this one, this one I like. This has got kind of that earth, you know. And he was he was giving an organoleptic evaluation right there on the spot and, and mm -hmm. going back and forth and deciding which particular strain he was most interested in. But I, I think really the the other side of the business, and you definitely know more about this than I do, is kind of the the food side, right? Because you know, I'm not going to go and smoke a marijuana joint, Ugh, right? They, I don't like how they smell, and you know, it's kind of yeah, yes. no things. So if if you're a, a middle aged dude like me in Colorado and you've got access to the stuff, you're going to go there and you're going to buy food, right? You're going to get gummies or candy or a chocolate bar or a powder like Ripple or things like this, and and try it that way. And that's what I did. And what was interesting then was they um, are very good at warning you because part of that, right, is the onset of what you were talking about as well too, right, is if you eat a gummy bear or something like that, you eat it and you're like, well, I don't feel anything, right? So you eat another one. Oh. And then, yeah, <laughs> then you can get in real trouble because it takes a while for these things to get into your metabolic pathway and have an impact that you can notice. And if you overindulge because you think it's not having an effect on you, you're in for a rude surprise. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it really is true. And, um, you know, part of that is the onset. And that's kind of so our onset is that it starts at 15 minutes. Um, wow. Uh, and that's fasted. So of course, there, there will be some variability as to whether or not a consumer has eaten and how recently they've eaten. That will affect the like how quickly you're going to feel the uh, psychoactive effects of THC. But um, I also wanted to say, Tammy, the tamper-proof packaging. Yeah, uh, you know, they say it has to be child resistant. And my, <laughs> in my, uh, you know, experience it's also adult proof um they're really hard to get open sometimes um <laughs> and you know there's some of them that are like you know foil packages and you know things like that and yeah the the zips and stuff like that that they have invented in this whole industry is really um it, it is really fascinating you're right <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember here in Colorado, I think there was an instance with some type of a, a beverage, right? Where it, where a, a kid had got a hold of a beverage, right? Or something like that. And so then the Colorado legislature reacted pretty quickly and changed the laws around that area and made them really you know, put very strong tamper resistant packaging around that in particular. Um, I remember I was working with a company at the time. They were not too happy about that. And they made the comment of how other industries aren't presented under this type of restriction, right? Alcohol or things like this. It's, you, know, you don't have tamper resistant packaging on alcohol, for example. Yeah. Uh, so it's been interesting how these laws have been evolving. And to your point earlier, Paige, this all varies state by state, right? Colorado, the laws here are very, very different from Washington state or things like this on how the legislatures chose to model their regulations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The regulations are an interesting topic of course uh, that is probably the most the largest challenge of being in this industry other than you know sales uh in general because there's a lot of large companies out there that are interested that want to capitalize that aren't quite ready to pull the trigger because of the regulatory environment so the fda has not touched cbd on a national level Mm -hmm. So let's just, you know, to clarify, I'm only referring to CBD right now. Mm -hmm. THC is not federally legal. There's been no discussion of that anytime 
you know, in the, in this recent history, other than just colloquially, uh, <laughs> how nice it would be. Um, so THD is going to have to be state to state. Every, you know, each state is going to have its own strategy on how they're going to handle THC. Um, and there's no plans in the near future for that I'm aware of um, for THC uh, taking that off the, the schedule one list or the, you know, the DEA um, mm -hmm. and having the FDA regulate that as a, as a supplement or drug. Um, but for CBD, which is, you know, a different cannabinoid, cannabidiol, um, the FD, you know, the FDA, ha they know about it. They've called for comments. They're really looking for the industry, you know, the, the key stakeholders in the industry to tell them what they know about this product and making sure that it's safe. So the FDA is currently in an evaluation period for this, um, you know, this supplement, in my opinion, um, it's not technically anything, but I think it's best positioned as a supplement because it's a botanical extract with a measurable potency. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that gives you a little bit of insight. So CBD is um, nationally available um, as of, you know, 2014 was, was when uh, the farm bill first passed where, we, you know, farmers began to grow hemp. And then in 2018, uh, it became a little bit more okay for you know, people to sell. Uh, so, but the FDA still hasn't regulated or said how we need to sell or what things are really important for the industry to be compliant with. So at Caliper, uh, we have elected to comply with 21 CFR 117 and 111 because we feel that that is the best fit for our company. So we're a food company that specializes in water soluble cannabinoids. We're not a cannabis company that happens to do food. Um, <laughs> so our structure has been such that it's a really easy fit for us to just say like, okay, well, the regulations have already been defined. Um, so we basically let the cards fall um, in terms of, well, the regulators are going to take their time. So in the meantime, that's what we're doing. We are, you know, we have GMP facilities, we're moving towards, um, you know, GFSI schemed uh, audit requirements so that we're just really working on the quality and consistency of our product and continuing to like, to drive improvements there. Um, <laughs> So yeah, the regulatory environment is is a little tricky. Uh, not everyone has to do uh, anything really, um, and it's pretty obvious when you take a look at what products are available um, on the market. The labeling is so variable, um, and I was going to say that's a really good way to pick out the bad actors. When you look at a tincture bottle and it says um, CBD hemp oil, twenty milligrams, what does that mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have a panel on the back. It doesn't have an like you know, its ingredient list is like two things. Um, it's possible that it's two things, but we've seen some really sketchy things out there. As a company that really feels that you know we're good actors and we're really trying to do things by the book, um, it's really crazy the things that people have commercialized and got into retail channels. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating, I think, as a consumer to look at this environment along with the knowledge that you know, 0.3% of THC is legal to sell in a CBD product. So anyone who might be concerned about THC and testing pot uh, for their job should avoid anything broad spectrum mm -hmm. or full spectrum, you know, um, and that's not, co that's covered, uh, you know, it's, it's legal. 0.3% yeah, THC on a dry weight basis is legal in your product. So um, that's something that everyone should really keep an eye on as a consumer um, when you're looking at you know, what to have because CBD is a great asset. You know, it's a great tool in the toolbox, you know, dietary supplements for people to use in order to manage their, their pain, anxiety, and you know, whatnot. Um, but you just have to be really careful about what product you choose. Mm -hmm. Well, which is always, always the case. Right. And <laughs> you, you brought up an interesting point. And so I wanted to circle back and emphasize this too, right. Is you're making food, right? You're making, if you're, a, if you're a company, right? You're making brownies or chocolate bars or gummy bears or whatever. And a lot of times I think the companies that are doing this don't understand that, right? They, they're just viewing the food as a delivery vehicle for the drug. And they're not taking the food aspects into consideration. So all the things that you need to worry about when you're manufacturing food. So sanitation and allergen control and suppliers and all these type of things that are not being considered, which is a huge yep. risk. Uh, a massive risk. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is very concerning. I don't even, I, you know, don't even want to think about uh, all the companies out there that really have no understanding of like what is required to manufacture a food product. Um, uh, that's, 
it is, I would say, a major issue in the industry. Um, there are definitely companies out there doing it right. Obviously, like we are there. I'm sure there are others. I don't know who they are because I don't work there. Um, <laughs> well, and, and, and the way I look at it too, right, is, is the cream's going to rise to the top. The good players are going to get more and more market share and these things will work themselves out. Yes. And, you know, just a little bit, I guess, we, you know, if you want, Brian, we can dive a little bit into the, you know, food safety um, and how we handle that. At, at caliper um i think supplier the supplier approval process has been one of the most challenging things and we do have a supplier preventive control in place um with the cannabinoid industry and with the cbd industry in general we have to think about our you know the source material so we're using aerial biomass um so cbd is extracted from the top parts of the plant um See, uh, the hemp is actually a bioremediator. So heavy metals and um, things, heavy metals are a concern, concern for us. Um, and it should, should be a concern for hemp and wherever it's grown in the, in the world, really. Um, also, in, pesticides are not, I don't think they're readily used. That's not an area of my expertise because we're not vertically integrated. We don't grow, we, do, we, do, we source. Um, so the w pesticides I don't think are regular, or, readily applied to hemp. They're pretty resistant on their own. They, you know, it's called weed for a reason. It grows like a weed. Um, <laughs> so have, pesticides are really more of a drift issue and from, you know, water uh, contamin, you know, cross-contamination from other sources. Mm -hmm. But pesticides are definitely still something from a food safety perspective we need to be aware of. Also mycotoxins, um, you know, aflatoxins and ochratoxin A, I believe, are the ones that we really are concerned about. And that's because um, like any other agricultural product, there's a harvest season. Um, mm -hmm. So this large amount of biomass is stored, dried and stored um, over the course of a year for any, you know, a supplier to take in chunks and manufacture into, you know, CBD isolate. So they'll go through an extraction process with that biomass. So my mycotoxins are a concern for that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And so just so that people kind of understand like the toxins, the aflatoxins and things like this, when you're storing uh, agricultural products, grains, you know, things like this that we're talking about, if you don't store them properly and there's excess moisture or they get wet or things like this, mold can grow, aspergillus can get in there and start growing and it will produce these toxins and then those stay behind in the product. Yes. Um, and so that's a little, it covers the, the chemical hazards for, you know, the concerns that kind of come top of mind for us. Um, we don't have any allergens in our products and there's not really inherently any allergens in the, you know, the CBD process at all. So that was a nice little non-concern for us personally, um, you know, at, at Caliper and Stillwater. Um, mm -hmm. We do, so moving on so biological hazards um very interesting topic of discussion so we have done some some studies we have funded some studies internally um for you know challenge studies with uh, certain types of environmental pathogens and our product is cbd has a tendency to be either bacteriostatic and can even be bactericidal um and, it, and of course, that really depends on your product attributes. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you know, put the study out there on blast because obviously there's a little bit of a proprietary nature to it. But, um, yeah, so it will depend on the product attribute, what's there. But CBD itself has not, I don't believe, the evidence that I have suggests that it does not support the, bro the growth of any type of pathogens that we would be concerned about in the food safety industry. So... Very, you know, that's a, if you take anything away from this, <laughs> you know, this conversation, that's a really important feature of this product or so, of this industry, at least. So from that pathogen standpoint, does that mean like when it's in the manufactured, like kind of like that oil state that you were talking about or, or what? Um, so that's kind of encroaching a little bit on the study, but um, mm -hmm. whether it's in an oil state, I mean, that's anaerobic. Um, you have other concerns there and we have not done any studies with any type of anaerobic um you know, like that, you know, with CBOT or anything like that, we wouldn't be concerned. Uh, we're not too concerned at this point in time, but um, especially since we leverage our suppliers for that, we say like, you know, if they're controlling for it based on the extraction process, whether or not, uh, you know, Clostridium botulinum would survive that is not likely. Um, so we do have some documentation on files supporting that. So um, anyway, so 
<laughs> putting well, that, it together. That's very interesting. And you're doing a great job of explaining this, right? And this is something that in, in, the, in the Food Safety Foundation, we talk about a lot, right? It's just, and that's why the, these, these food safety chats are super helpful, right? Is if, if you can't explain what you're doing so that someone else can understand it, how is a regulator or an auditor going to understand it, right? You oh, have to no, be able to tell the story. <laughs> Right. Yes. Here's why we do the things we do, and here's how we manage that. And if something doesn't go right, here's those corrective actions. So the way you're explaining it is perfect. I love it. Thank you. And you know, to answer your question, I think you were driving at you know CBD isolate. So it's it's a white powder. Um, their water activity is very low. Um, and you know the you know it's no yeah the, I, I would not say that any type of pathogens would grow on the powder with that water activity and that yeah. high of a potency because when you're talking about an isolate you're typically in you're in the 96 to 100 range um for mm -hmm. for purity um when you're when you're buying typical commercial cbd isolate gotcha well corey, corey is here this morning always great to have corey here so she has got a couple questions for us here Paige. so uh what cannabis ingredient is used in edibles is it the oil so I guess that can vary, right? I mean, it's going to depend. Yeah, on it would depend on the product, um, uh, you know, and who you're buying it from. Uh, CBD isolate is is a fat soluble, um, you know, it's an it's a fat soluble ingredient. Um, it's an isolate, so it's you know almost purely CBD. Um, we personally, we you know we use a carrier oil um, that because we need to make sure that. Uh, there's a little bit of variability of potency, so um, carrier oil will help us standardize that. Um, and then we put that as in a water soluble, you know, we emulsify um, and homogenize and create a water soluble product. So mm -hmm. for us, um, I think that answers your question. Sometimes uh, people will, use, you know, when you're talking about cannabis and we're, let's, you know, say the THC side, marijuana. Um, yeah. And, and there's a lot of people that will just use the straight up THC distill distillate which does have multiple cannabinoids in it and a lot of terpenes. So um, the process of distillation differs heavily from isolation. Um, they're, not, they're not the same thing um, whatsoever. So the conversation, that's a little bit outside of my area of expertise because like I said, we are a food company and we, uh, Caliper Foods and, and Stillwater Brands, we purchase the cannabinoids uh, extracted from other, com other companies. Um, and then we, we create our food product. Gotcha. So it's, it's essentially treated like an ingredient for you then from your food safety. Oh, plant. totally. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And it's a, is it is a challenging ingredient at that, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in terms of consistency, THC to stay in the marijuana realm. Um, there are so many challenges with that ingredient. Um, the supplier, you know, depending on how, what their extraction process looks like and their distillation process, you get the spectrum of organoleptics is massive. And the spectrum of potency that you can deliver is also pretty wide. You know, you can get a THC distillate that ranges, you know, from 60 to 94 percent. Um, sometimes a little higher, but that makes me question the test results a little bit because mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it is still a distal. It's not an isolate, right? Um, so the organoleptics is just huge. It's like you can either be tasting something that is like you just went outside and took a bite out of grass, um, you know, a, a skunk grass. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> or you can have something like our product, with, you know, the distillate that we use to make our product, which is barely perceptible. You can you can barely even taste the marijuana. We do. I think that there's something nice about having a little bit of like hashiness in there just to know that like, OK, I am consuming something. Um, but it's my own personal preference. Um, huh. and he has your ISO, John MCT says your carrier. Yes, those are the most stable and, you know, easily to source uh, in the, you know, for us in the industry. Interesting. So medium chain triglycerides. Yep. Interesting. So Corey had another question here as well. Does the oil inhibit the growth of pathogens? So I think you kind of jumped in, Corey, on the conversation. So pretty much on that point, it was, I think the short answer there is yes, right? I mean, it, I would say it, it depends. So when you're right. talking about marijuana, um, I am not familiar with the distillation process enough to know what the the heat and hold times are, whether or not that would eliminate the possibility of um, growth or proliferation of Clostridium botulinum. Um, but for CBD, I know that there are some um, extraction methods, I can't say all, but I do know that there are some that do have uh, heat and hold times that are hot and long enough to make sure that that, to say that with certainty that it's not going to grow. So 
the answer is as with most things it depends <laughs> <laughs> well and the thing right with, with pathogens right they have this amazing ability to surprise us because mm -hmm. the the recalls that come up and the things that we think are safe all of a sudden aren't safe right so peanut butter oh oh oops right and then all of a sudden we have these big issues with peanut butter uh, the one that always strikes me is the one, the recall that we had with listeria in roasted sunflower seeds, which is absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, it's um, not wet, but how was it? <laughs> right. Well, it ended up being a cross-contamination issue. So they were storing the raw and the roasted nuts too close together, and, and it was mm -hmm. recontaminating the roasted nuts. Um, bacteria and pathogens, right, they're resilient little suckers, and they're going to find a way to, to make our lives difficult, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, there's that piece of it too. So we were talking about your food safety plan, right? So, so oh, we yes. talked about kind of the micro side of things. We talked about the chemical side of things. What about the physical? As a quality manager, what type of physical things were you Ooh. looking at in your food safety plan? Oh, great question. So um, physical hazards internally, um, we don't have a lot of the of post process. You know, when we receive ingredients, uh, we're not seeing any contamination events from our side of things. Um, you know, the physical hazards are the same as the regular food industry. It's, you know, your metal, wood, and, you know, just other foreign material. Um, I can't say that we've had a ton of technical physical hazards in terms of large enough pieces of, of foreign material in our product, but um, foreign material from a quality standpoint is a huge issue in the industry. Um, we actually have created a preventive control in-house in order to screen um, our inbound CBD. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, no matter who we get it from, there's always some type of residuals um, there, you know, whether it's plant matter, plastic, um, <laughs> there's been some metal, uh, you know, you name it, we've, you know, lint, we found it. Um, so that's more of a quality, not a food safety issue. But yeah, physical, mm -hmm. you know, foreign material contaminants is something that I would say anyone who is in the business of CBD currently um, should definitely take a special look at. We have seen it transfer all the way through the process. Um, and once we did apply that preventive control, all of our, you know, it wasn't like a ton of issues, but the things that we did see were no longer there. So we just mitigated that risk all the way up front um, after we received the, you know, the material before we started using it. Huh, interesting. So I'm a little bit confused here, Paige. So the CBD that's coming in is that oil or is it something else? It's a powder. Um, so okay. CBD, CBD isolate is in a powder. Um, so when we make our product, we have to, like I said, before we use a carrier oil in order to make sure that our, you know, our dosage is correct. Um, and we can deliver and, and create our emulsion the way that we have um, defined in our, our proprietary technical pro uh, platform. So wow. um, yeah, so we have to create a, a liquid form before we use it. Um, so uh -huh. yeah, during, you know, we, when we, uh, dissolve the CBD in that carrier oil, that's when we're able to, you know, take a look and, and sift through. Gotcha. Okay. That makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Um, and so um, I cannot pronounce this. So N I I X Z. So if, if, if people in the comments haven't been reading through this, what's really great about this and thank you for, for posting this information is somebody who's benefiting directly from this new technology, right. In helping to eliminate and alleviate pain and things like this. So that that's, really good so thank you for sharing this information and i i think part of what we wanted to bring up here too right is is this needs to be this this products that are in the marketplace on the edible side and probably even on on the plant side as well too need to be looked at from what we're doing right now and i wanted to you know commend you Paige, and how you guys are doing a caliper on managing this as a food safety system right and looking at gfsi fsqf other standards and modeling on that because you still can't get certified to it in the US um, and using that and saying, yes, this is how we're gonna treat this and this is how we're gonna manage food safety and these are the risks we're gonna look at. So I think you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> so on the food safety side, right? So we've talked about the physical, chemical, microbiological. So with your preventive controls and your prerequisite program, so the preventive controls, right, are the, the ones that people pay attention to the most if FDA was to come in and pay a visit to you, which in current environment, right, I don't think that happens. Well, um, anyone who's registered with the FDA can be can get a visit, right? So yeah. we are, we're registered and, I, you know, that's one of the things that if you're a food company, no matter what you're, you know, you're producing, whether it's a cannabinoid or not, you should be registered. Um, mm -hmm. So we, they're, we're on their radar. They have not yet come. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yes. Um, so 
for the preventive controls, allergens, we talked about that. You don't have any allergens, which is great, right? Everybody wants that. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have an RTD food. product, so we do have sanitation controls in place. San so, okay, so you got sanitation in place. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking a little about suppliers, right? That's that's always a big preventive control, too. Did you want to dive more into the supplier side of things and how you manage things? or, or Sure. What? Yeah, actually, that's, a, I think, something that would be valuable to anyone who's listening. Um, the supplier controls, so we're not doing anything crazy, new, you know, innovative in terms of that. So it's really about the what you're looking for. Um, so we're like anyone else, we require a, you know, a C of A um, from a third party. Um, we will not accept a C of A from the supplier because we just don't have, you know, they're not accredited one ISO 17025 and method variability for this industry is pretty, you know, pretty variable. Uh, <laughs> so what we look at C of A's um, from a third party, from a, from a lab who's accredited that we trust, um, that usually we choose. Um, and we look at all of those contaminant types. Um, one of the heaviest focuses for us is on those chemical contaminants, um, panels for residual solvents, um, pesticide residues, heavy metals are the, the biggest ones to really, um, you know, obviously all of them are important, um, but those are the ones that are most likely to, to have anything that's even a measurable quantity. Um, we're also looking at the pathogen, um, you know, sampling for pathogens. In this industry, typically, I mean, I'm not totally happy with how, uh, you know, the microbiology of this industry, um, the sampling methods are just not sufficient. Um, you know, your typical, you know, at Eurofins or, you know, a, you know, a lab that would be used nationally, you, you need a 25 gram sample in order to test for salmonella. And of course it's on the company in order to make sure that sampling is um, representative of, of what you're, what lot you're testing. There have been some labs that will report in one gram and I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of like, oh, it's a little nuts. Um, so the microbiology of this industry is not strong, I would say. Um, but that's, only, again, my personal opinion. Um, so for suppliers, we're looking really at solvents, metals, micro, you know, uh, pesticides and mycotoxins. Um, mm -hmm. And we will take a deep dive at a, lot, a pretty long list of items before we release our product. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, anyone who's been, you know, has seen a C of A or looks in the industry will know, okay, well, what are, what solvents, what pesticides, um, you know, heavy metals, easy answer, the core four, you know, you're talking about your arsenic, lead, cad cadmium, and, um, and mercury. And mm -hmm. those ones, you'll see variable levels of required, re regulatory driven, required, um, contaminant levels have to be under, you know, a thousand parts per million or something. And that's not a very strict standard. So uh, <laughs> we, we have a little bit stricter standards internally because, you know, in the food industry, that would not fly, no. right? Um, <laughs> for, for lead. Yeah. You know, you, you want to, you want to control that a little bit um, because depending on the product application, we, we, cre you know, for our ingredients business, we create a, we create a concentrate and we sell it and that then that has to go into another application. So, doing the math and making sure that our product does not contain any of those um, contaminants up front is really important because again, we're not going to, you know, our process doesn't add anything in it into it, but it's like, you know, we just want to make sure that what we are sourcing um, is not going to contribute to a bad result in a finished good. Um, or in this industry where there's, you know, we're like under a microscope here. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not giving anyone a reason to, pull us off the shelf or come in and, and, you know, guns blazing and say, what are you doing here? Uh, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, Brian, Brian had a question. Good morning, my friend. Uh, question about processing. How is the homogenization process controlled to ensure that the CBD or THC is evenly distributed throughout the product? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, in simple terms, uh, you know, you're talking about your time, your RPM, and then of course, what, you know, whatever homogenization your unit you're using, um, how large of a pore size you're, you know, you're pushing that liquid through. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, and I think here in Colorado too, right? I mean, there's, there's a big control around on the testing of the finished product and the amount of THC per serving size, right? So was it 10, 10 millicentigrams per serving or something like that? Maximum of 10 in the recreational field, yep. Right. And so if you're at 11, right, your, your lot, you can't sell that. 
not true. Um, oh. So, uh, so that, well, 10 is what's on the product label, okay. right? That's, that's the, the product that you're trying to sell. You, in Colorado, you have a 15% variance that is allowed. 15 oh. is a lot. 15 is pretty significant. So that means if you are targeting 10 milligrams, you can have, what is it, 12.5 or something in oh, the really? product and still sell it. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I didn't know that. And you can also have 8. Point five. So you know, like the you know, I don't, I don't think the math is correct there, but okay, you know, so they, yeah. So they've got a, a little bit of a bell curve going there around that standard. Totally. Yeah. So they they in Colorado, you have a fifteen percent variance, and um, so I think Brian, I think I answered your question. Um, but you know, in Colorado for the edibles business, we do have a requirement for homogeneity testing. Um, so that's you know, the sample size is a larger requirement. So the MED uh, licensed labs will take you know, an entire finished good unit and test several different, you know, test potency over, you know, several different times or different individual units, and then do that as an average, making sure that they're all uh, not an average. Um, they'll make sure that they're all measuring about the same. In the same. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think too, with like a product like yours, like with, with like, you know, Ripple or something like that, where you have a powder, right? Just the process itself is going to create a lot more standardization within that versus let's say somebody who's making a batch of brownies and they've got a big whole bar mixer and they're dumping the ingredients in and mixing it up and then baking the brownies, right? Um, they have to be a lot more careful with making sure that everything is consistent within those batches. Yes, to totally. And I see Nick's, um, yes, we do. We have a third party CFAs for every single lot we get. Um, and it is from an accredited lab in Colorado. We do have regulations. The CDPHE just, um, uh, past regulations that were active July 1st to require that all of the hemp testing for finished goods are done at an accredited and Colorado approved lab. Um, so we do have all of our, our stuff go through there. Yep. Nice. Good point. Good point. So, wow. Time, time is flying here. We're already at 46 minutes. So <laughs> one, of, one of the things here, Paige, that, that I wanted to kind of hit you up a little bit on here and give people kind of an idea here with the Food Safety Foundation, you as a member um, how, how has the Food Safety Foundation helped you with this? Oh, so much. Um, so I, I think I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, I was a food scientist. Um, quality is something that I kind of stepped into, like most, I think like most of us. <laughs> uh, so I started learning quality and I've been doing it for about almost three years. Um, and being in the Food Safety Leadership Group and the Food Safety Foundation has been a tremendous value. Um, being able to talk to you, Brian, and really like tune in on these weekly meetings and um, leveraging consultants and their expertise uh, has really helped fill in the gaps for me as I'm learning. Um, after I've done the PCQI course, I finished it twice um, just to relearn um, and make sure because there's always something you can learn and always something you can do a little bit better. So having, you know, access to you guys and the people who have been in the industry for a long time, uh, just to bounce things off of and really calibrate myself and make sure that I'm doing, um, I'm building things the way that people expect uh, them to be built for the food industry uh, has been like so worth it. Uh, it's been a really, really great um, investment, I believe. Awesome. Glad, glad you're enjoying it. And, and I think too here with our, with our partnership now, our collaboration with EAS Consulting, we have access now to over a hundred consultants with I think I think Tim Lombardo who runs the uh, department there. We have access to over 100 consultants and the average the average length of experience is over 25 years for the consultants in that group. Right. So if you have a question, right, somebody's going to know the answer, which is really cool. Right. And I think it's the point that we're trying to make with this. And the whole reason we do the, these food safety chats on Friday, right, is food safety. We need to share information. And to, to your point, Paige, I learned three new things, at least on, on the call today for this new space. And so it's a two-way street, right? So thank you for helping educate me as well. Oh, sure. um, so that's much appreciated. So everybody, uh, this has been a fantastic chat. I mean, this is an amazing space. I kind of refer to it as the Wild West, right? Because everything is growing and evolving and it's really exciting, right? To see how this space has, has developed over these past few years. And uh, to be at the cutting edge of that page, we really appreciate all you're doing out there. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to uh, at least be able to share, you know? No, much appreciated. So, of course, everybody, we do this every Friday at 8 a.m. Mountain, 10 a.m. Eastern. And please, if you have suggestions on topics you would like us to cover like this, 
uh, please send me an email. My email is on here. Uh, if you have questions for Paige, her email is on here as well, too. So I assume Paige is okay if people reach out to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Food safety, right? It's something that we have to collaborate on because we all have to get better on it. So totally. thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate it. Uh, Baja, good to see you, my friend. Um, and we will catch you back here next Friday. So everybody enjoy your weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Paige. Bye.